Uh oh. Hey folks, Paul Roberts here. For this video fishing journal, uh, number 31 now, I'm going to introduce a new water body, um, our next uh, laboratory pond. Once known as a heavily vegetated big bass water, uh, this pond suffered massive flooding in 2013 that greatly changed its character. Uh, mud and silt rolled in, clouded the water, uh, killing off that vegetation. Um, and, and those sediments continued to resuspend with every wind event, uh, keeping plant growth from reestablishing, uh, along with a healthy population of grass carp, um, maybe a little too healthy. With the loss of all that glorious vegetation, I sadly <laughs> moved on. Now, seven years later, the, the silt has appeared to have settled, uh, uh, but the pond is now quite different from the one that I once knew. And I wondered just how the bass had fared, uh, uh, their growth in particular. So I decided to make this, an, uh, this journal another learn a new water body piece, like we did in Video Fishing Journal 19, uh, using the same ecological approach. So what we'll be looking for are the functional, that is the living components that make up the food chain there, and the physical structural components on which they make their livings. Okay, this is a functional look at, at structure that we always hear about. What is structure? Uh, what counts as structure? What doesn't count as structure? I'm not going to go into that in particular, but I think you'll start to see how an ecologist would look at this. All this ecological info allows me to home in on predator-prey contexts that exist out there. And we'll be doing this in a water body type that's quite different from that shallow, weedy water that we explored in Journal 19. And certainly from our jungle warfare pond that we explored last summer um, in video fishing journals 21 to 23. This one's a deeper water body than most of the others we've featured so far and it sports little major cover. As we said, no vegetation, uh, and essentially no wood or large rock. Okay, those, those major cover types. It also has a larger cast of potential prey fish species in it than most of our other smaller shallow waters do. What I did to characterize the options on this water body was to map it uh, via sonar. I started with structures attached to the shorelines, the easiest to find, and uh, most seasonally appropriate for the fishing, and then away from shore for any interesting offshore structures that might be out there. Um, areas that may become increasingly important as the seasons progress. I don't have mapping software on my older uh, sonar models, so I, I, I do my mapping by uh, overlaying my findings onto a satellite image. Uh, when I get home. What I'm going to present here is a much simplified version of my actual working map. Uh, this is done to protect the fishery and especially uh, other fishers that uh, may also fish this water. Um, I don't want to uh, have people feel like I'm uh, intruding on their water and I know how that feels. Okay, let's break into our pond. The satellite images that I looked at revealed little <laughs> in terms of bottom structure or in water cover or objects. Uh, uh, and that was due to low water clarity. And when actually on the water, that low water clarity and lack of cover also provided few visual cues as to bottom structure. Uh, the surrounding topography, which we can often look at to get an idea of what's under the water, also revealed little uh, beyond the fact that it's a flatland water body. Uh, however, it's also a former gravel quarry, uh, gravel pit, which means that there was once heavy equipment in it excavating uh, when it was an active quarry uh, uh, over 40 years ago now. So I hoped there would be some convoluted uh, uh, bottom areas left behind. In general, I have to say this is a tough water body to read by eye alone. So after doing some sonar mapping, I found an average depth of 10 feet, with most of the pond 9 feet or deeper uh, at, at the current springtime water level. Roughly 25% of the water 
is over 12 feet with a 17 foot max. Now, in general, the most interesting structures to the fish involve shallow shelves for feeding and spawning habitat. These are the areas that lie in what's called the photic zone, uh, exposed to sunlight, where most primary production, uh, that is photosynthesis by vegetation, takes place. Thus, these areas tend to crank out the food. And I, we can liken these areas actually to the lake's kitchen. Larger area shelves often hold more promise through sheer size and production area than smaller area shelves might. Access to deeper water and or good appropriate cover is generally required to attract large predator fish too, providing access to security. Also, the shelf edge itself may serve as an object for object-oriented fish like bass to relate to. Shelves accompanied by rapid depth change are often of greatest year-round interest because as seasons progress, uh, in, in the summer and winter especially, uh, fish tend to shift toward deeper realms. The shoreline shelves in this pond slope pretty quickly from a four to six foot shelf edge into the nine to 11 foot deep basin. However, the shelves here are mostly quite narrow and they rim the entire pond. Uh, maybe a bit too much of a good thing here. There are also a few rubble top point bars that extend shelf area out into the pond, um, but they're pretty short in length. They do, however, attract fish. In waters with little in the way of obvious abrupt structures, uh, more subtle ones can become important and they may be less than obvious to us. Moving offshore, I found some elongated flat top bars uh, not attached to the shorelines, obviously left from the gravel mining operations. All are eight to nine feet deep on top and drop quickly on, on all sides into 10 to 12 feet of water. The depth changes around these bars are small, precipitous but small, two to four feet. But again, such small changes can attract fish if they're the only ones out there. Okay, that's the structural layout of our pond. Uh, the major question now is how important might these offshore versus the inshore areas be in this pond? In most waters and especially so in smaller lakes, shorelines and their shelves, what ecologists call the littoral zone, tend to provide the most primary food chain production. However, substantial primary production also occurs in open water, called the limnetic or pelagic zone, where phytoplankton, instead of rooted plants, found a food chain. All water bodies have both production zones. Uh, and actually a few others that, that we'll cover in a future fundamentals piece on, on food chains. But the relative significance or importance of these production zones varies across different water bodies. In our lab pond, lacking rooted vegetation, a significant portion of the primary production occurs in the limnetic open water zone. And the strong algal blooms out there suggest a pretty fertile soup. This fertile soup was found to support a decent gizzard shad population, uh, a primarily open water species. Thus, offshore topography, those elongated bars I found, may actually turn out to be important, especially as the season wears on. Being an abandoned gravel quarry on flat land, <laughs> the bottom substrate out there is fine to mid-sized sediments, uh, silt to cobble. Again, there's no appreciable large rock or wood. Coarse substrate is important in terms of food production though, for the larger crevice spaces, uh, surface area that it provides compared to those finer sediments. 
Those cobbles, though, are prime habitat for crayfishes. And there are some exposed along some of the shorelines due to wave action, as we see in our other gravel quarry ponds, and on top of some of those offshore bars. Soft material uh, composed of inorganic soils, organic soils, and detritus, that's uh, dead plant and animal matter, collect over time on the pond bottom. Such areas uh, are not dead zones. They support microflora and fauna communities. Um, that's tiny algae, fungi, and bacteria that feed insect larvae that are in turn primary food for prey-sized fishes. Gizzard shad themselves and crayfishes are direct detritus feeders. These soft, organic, highly fertile materials collect in deep basins, in pockets, or, or inside turns, um, and especially out from uh, current inflows, uh, tributaries or culverts where water is coming in, um, or, or groundwater such as spring seeps. There are no t such tributaries entering this, this dug, excavated pond, but a stand of cattails there reveals the location of a spring inflow. And this fertile area, it's hard to tell, it just doesn't look very spectacular, but this fertile area has always attracted bluegills, bass, big bass, <laughs> and channel cats, as well as uh, gizzard shad of all sizes. The more diverse, complex, convoluted cover is, the better providing, once again, larger crevice space, more surface area for life of all sizes to find shelter and food. Larger, hard cover pieces such as rock and wood are almost non-existent in this pond. Um, I did find one small pile of chunk rock that was left behind from some minor construction uh, along one shoreline, um, and, and it gave up a good bass. Soft cover in the form of vegetation, uh, once again, is virtually non-existent in this pond remains to be seen if much vegetation at all develops over the summer. Some shorelines had some tall, have some tall trees on them, uh, and, and that can count as, as cover or objects uh, in, in some circumstances. Uh, and some of the shorelines have, have willow thickets. Uh, the spring water levels when I was there were high enough that some of those willows were flooded in one to two feet of water, um, and, uh, but I only found small bass in them. To get a bead on fish species, I uh, spoke with anglers at Pondside. Uh, one fly fisherman told me he'd, he'd caught crappie, uh, which I later then saw on sonar, um, and, and they give a pretty telltale signal. Uh, I watched for appropriate habitats for different prey species, uh, watched for dead fish uh, floating or, or washed up on shore, uh, and, and I watched for fish activity by eye and by sonar. Now, interpreting fish marks on sonar is often educated guesswork based on knowing which species are likely to be where, their, their relative sizes, and their behaviors, uh, on top of knowing how sonar works. Our pond was found to contain largemouth bass with lots of juveniles that were stocked as fingerlings in previous years, bluegills, green sunfish, black crappie, yellow perch, gizzard shad, uh, common carp, grass carp, channel cats, and, and crayfish. So, of that cast of characters, which are likely to be most important in our bass fishing? This comes down to their relative abundance, how many of them there are, uh, and their vulnerability how easy they are for bass to catch, uh, something that, that often changes through the year. Uh, I also went right to the source here too by doing some stomach sampling of mature bass I caught using stomach lavage. I found young bass to be exceedingly abundant and then lavaged small bass from, from two of the bass that I caught. They were probably the most abundant fish species out there or fish out there. Uh, bluegills were present, um, both sunning 
um, and rising to spring midges, uh, but but in smaller numbers than I would expect to see in in my weedy ponds. Uh, I found a fresh, good-sized, roughly eight-inch yellow perch floating dead uh, from a hook wound. Uh, this pond had always had yellow perch, and I was glad to, to, to see that some still exist there. Crayfishes were likely to be found where exposed cobbles exist. Um, we can expect that um, in, our, in my gravel quarries here. Uh, and then that's along shorelines and across those bar tops. Gizzard shad of several size brackets were seen out there on the surface on sonar and being chased by bass in, in open water. And at one point I foul hooked a, a mature shad of about nine inches. We are replete with predators here. Uh, this water is heavily fished by local anglers and as I fished I watched ospreys and bald eagles catching fish. Uh, white pelicans big enough to swallow a mature bass, um, as well as herons and mink are regulars on, on this water. There was one pelican on the pond that appeared to be ill, and I eventually found him dead Aww. and towed him to shore at the request of a concerned birder. Yeah, Rigor Mortis too, she died sometime in the night. All right, let's kick her out of here. Besides other bass and large channel catfish, this water contains no other major competitors. Uh, no muskies, no pike, no wipers, no walleyes. So with that introduction, let's go fish this pond together and try to pin down some of those contexts the bass have developed to make successful livings out there. Successful bass may grow to be large bass if the water body allows, and this one may still have that potential uh, despite losing its, its cover. Our initial exploratory outings um, occurred in the spring, um, early to late pre-spawn. Uh, the bass transitioning from wintering toward uh, spawning over that time. On the first outing, with a 45 degree Fahrenheit core temperature, nearly all fish appeared on sonar uh, at the 7 to 10 foot depths, all around the pond. During the mid-pre-spawn, when the core temps had reached 55 Fahrenheit, back-to-back -back super cold fronts with 10 and 12 degree Fahrenheit nights and a total of 24 inches of snow falling knocked core temperatures back to 50 Fahrenheit. But, as I said in our previous video fishing journal from this spring, the water reheated to 55 again within a week and the spawn appeared to be coming on schedule. On my last outing during late pre-spawn, I could see mature bass on, on sonar suspended in four to six feet of water coming up. Water clarity and water color was uh, two to three feet and green due to, to algae, algae blooms. Next, I chose basic tools to explore with uh, for the time of year. Uh, light and medium power tackle, uh, mid-depth and bottom stuff that will then be fine-tuned as I learn more for subsequent trips. From what I found out, in these outings, these initial outings, I'll be adding some shad and offshore tackle to my arsenal. Uh, uh, this pond had never had uh, uh, as many shad as I found out there this, this year. Okay, let's do it. Let's hit the water. Tall shoreline trees. Are they going to become important in this place now? Say that because we've lost inshore or offshore cover, lost our vegetation and our wood. That's a fish and a good one, I believe. Yep. Who got we? Oh yes. All right, 
Come on there. Mama. Oh yes. Oh yes. Oh, look at that. Not too red in the mouth. No food sticking out, but holy moly, you got a lot of eggs in you, honey. Let's not drift too far here, Pa. All right, look at that small mouth. So you're still growing. Nice. Very nice. Nice fish. All right. Adios, honey. Try that again. So it's a, a swim bait, okay? Standard swim bait. Um, but I put an overhead spinner on it, and what that does uh, is slows it way down in the water. That that fish was cold. That's a fish. That's a heavy fish, unless I've fouled a carp, which is what it feels like. Yep. Darn. <laughs> Look at the size of the freaking boils out there. I want my jig back, man. Oh, it, I've actually caught a catfish, I think. Let's see what it is. It hit, hit it, I think. It's in the mouth. Is it a channel? It's a channel cat. It's a large channel cat. <laughs> Darn. <laughs> Thump. All right, you. Come on, turn back around. Glad the water's cold. Let's take him right in. Oh man. Good old Ned. All right, don't puncture my boat, whatever you do, little fella. All right. How's that? <laughs> That's a good sized channel. There. Now, you can go. You can go, little fella. <laughs> you talking to me, are you? Alright, there you go. That was a little fish. <sighs> what is this today, man? Ooh, that's not nice. 
Mm. All right, one at a time. One and two. A little tiny guy again. Whoa, I got pounded and I missed her. All right. Wow, that was a hell of a hit. Let's drop anchor. There's one, finally. And a good one. Unless it's a catfish. <laughs> no, it's not a cat. Well, it might be. It's not a cat. It's a good bass. Finally. I think the best looking point that I've found. Oh, that's a good fish. Oh, that's a very nice fish. That's what I came here for. Oh, there's a 20 inch fish. Look at the small mouth on it though. Okay. Yep. Very nice. Very, very nice. Yeah, she's well hooked. One. Two. Each out the way they came in. Oh, she's nice. Well, let's see what we get here. Just curious if she's gonna go. She's probably just 19. Okay, I'm not finding anything in that stomach. All right, sweetie. Let's put you back. There you go, lady. Bumping over those twigs and sticks. There's a fish. Not a big fish. Small bass. Hey. Hey, you jump. Hey. Okay, we're sampling the ear class sizes now. You're fat too, man. Alright. Finally, spring has sprung. Huh? Bass? Yeah. Twelver.
Oops. Swim it out of there. You just spooked a fish. His line landed on a... I'm going to assume it's a bluegill. There's a fish. <laughs> uh, that was classic. Uh, basically got hung on something, popped it off, and he nailed it. Oh, come on. Oh, man. That is a sharp hook. All right, it's just going to keep re-hooking, so... There we go. Hmm. Look at, it's got a bruise on the other side. Look at it, it's got a bruise all across here. He was nabbed by somebody. That's a fish. Not a, not a big fish again. Here we go. Oh man, there's a lot of these. There's another one. I gotta find out about these fish. Are they stocked? Let's see if I get whacked again. That's one. And I got him. And it's a little better fish. <laughs> Not by much, but... Hey, buddy. Okay, buddy. Mm -hmm. Adios. All right. There's a lot of little bass here. here. Sixty three and a half degrees here. Wow, I gotta use these stats every time. Okay, this is telling me that there's a quite a number of bass in here. There we are again. Same hookup. Adios, fella. It's okay, hon. It's okay, honey. It's okay, honey bear. Yeah. There's a bass. Okay. 
something. Hard earned, but I'll take them. Shard of something. dudes here. I just saw a rise of all things in this breeze. Uh-oh. I thought I saw a wake follow this up, but that I hope it's not a catfish. It feels like a cat. I saw a wake shoot up behind my... And it's got a lot of weight. All right, let's see when it comes by me what we got. Oh, it might be a bass. It is, yes. That's what we came here for and did all this freaking work. Boop! Hey, none of that. Ugh. Let's first get a length. And it's, it's probably half inch past that mark. fish. 19 inches anyway. Crayfish. Okay, that's really good to know. That is really helpful to know because I knew there was a lot of craws in here. And I haven't been fishing the bottom because I've had a lot of suspended fish. There you go. All right. 
big crayfish too. Long pinchers, green, long pinchers, green and, and orange. Uh, or connectees, maybe virilis. Alright, very cool.